and very and it's had much more rain than it can usually handle despite some clearing skies yesterday the creeks and rivers had risen by almost a meter virtually cutting off the area from the rest of the country in fact so much so that the bridge into the watch site had to be quickly replaced But by 3 a.m. this morning, the bridge was ready for the groups of keen stargazers who'd made the pilgrimage despite the weather. Ian Crumpton from Dunedin, an ancient man who's been able to look out and, and it collects considerably more light than your eye does, so you can see a lot fainter. And they, were and they were rewarded by a break in the clouds for a fine view of the comet. While they struggled and finally overcame those very bad conditions in South Canterbury, final preparations were being made in London and West Germany by astronomers and scientists. The countdown began at about 11 o'clock this morning, and it was 11 p.m. in Europe, when we joined the BBC's Patrick Moore at the European Space Agency Mission Control in Darmstadt. This is a picture of Halley's Comet being sent back now by Giotto. Let me stress that those colours are not genuine. They indicate differences in brightness and therefore differences in density. And undoubtedly the mysterious icy nucleus is somewhere inside that patch that shows up on your screen as being blue. The object of tonight's mission is to follow Giotto all the way in. At the present moment it's something like a quarter of a million kilometres away from the nucleus of the comet. At closest approach, in just over an hour's time, it'll only be 540 kilometres away. And it's then, if at all, that we're going to see the nucleus. We've simply got to wait and see. Halley's Comet is named in honour of the second Astronomer Royal, Edmund Halley. His headquarters was at Greenwich, at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, where James Burke now is. James. Thank you, Patrick. Well, I'm here on what is a bitterly cold night at Greenwich because it was here, in a sense, where the original scientific interest in the comet Halley really got going. And I'm here especially to look at the technology behind tonight's literally once-in-a-lifetime encounter, the encounter between the spacecraft Giotto and the comet called Halley. That we are able at all to rendezvous with a comet travelling at 68 kilometres a second 230 million kilometres out in space is mainly due to the original predictions by Edmund Halley, England's second astronomer royal here some 300 years ago. The latest of his successes is with us tonight, here in the octagon room where the earliest observations were made. Professor Sir Francis Graham Smith, the 13th astronomer royal, is watching these events with his guests who include Professor Alec Boxenberg, director of the Royal Greenwich Observatory at hurst Monceau, and other experts in what we'll loosely call tonight cometry. We'll be talking to them later. As Giotto races towards the encounter at about 70 times the speed of a bullet, I will be taking a look at the onboard instruments, and in particular at that camera that we hope will answer fundamental questions, not just about Halley, but perhaps about the origins of the solar system and even the origin of life on Earth. I say we hope for two good reasons. One, Giotto may not survive the journey to the heart of the comet to take those first ever pictures of its nucleus. And two, even if it does, the pictures that the two Russian spacecraft that went past the other day <clears throat> made it all look pretty dicey. The situation as they saw it makes us feel that tonight the encounter may turn out to be a more dangerous event than was perhaps foreseen. But more of those problems later on, because right now, the spacecraft is heading into the comet's coma, a giant cloud of <clears throat> gas and dust surrounding the nucleus. And since Giotto's encounter speed is about 240,000 kilometers an hour, every tiny dust particle will hit Giotto like a bullet. This is what the spacecraft looks like as it heads for Halley, like this with its dust shield forward. And as we go through the evening, I hope we will be able to see the build-up of computer-generated computer data showing the dust impacts actually hitting the shield at the time. The point is, will that dust shield work? 
Well, you'll be able to see the answer to that, as I said here, as the onboard impact sensors feedback second-by-second -second data on the kind of punishment that Giotto's taking. If the sensors themselves aren't destroyed, that is. Initially, that data and all the rest is coming in from space to a huge radio telescope in Australia and then to the European Space Operations Centre, Patrick, which is where I am now, at the headquarters of the European Space Agency. This is where the information from the comet is being received, but the real action is taking place over 90 million miles away. Here's the science area. We'll be meeting some of the principal investigators during the course of the night. And, of course, there's the control room, which recently had the job of directing the spacecraft to its precise distance from the nucleus. But since the Russian and Japanese encounters, there's been a great deal of controversial discussion among the scientists here as to what that distance should be. We know that at the moment, Giotto is inside the coma, but outside the main dust area. What exactly is a comet? Basically, it has a nucleus, described as a dirty ice ball, which is the only reasonably massive part. When the ices are warmed, they start to evaporate, and the nucleus hides itself inside the head or coma, which is why we've never yet seen a cometary nucleus, something we'd like to rectify before this program's over. There are two types of tails. The plasma, or gas tail, is caused by the solar wind striking the comet's coma, the solar wind being a stream of electrified particles being sent out by the sun all the time in all directions. The dust tail is produced by the sun's light striking the coma and driving the dust particles outwards. And that's why comet tails always point more or less away from the sun. At the moment, Halley's comet is moving outwards, and so it's traveling tail first. The solar wind interacts with the cometary dust, and the solar wind is variable, gusty if you like, and this causes marked changes in the comet's tail. Giotto has already passed through the bow shock set up by the traveling comet, and we're getting ready for the main encounter. So let's consult the experts. What do they feel? Well, I think this is the, uh, the most exciting part of the mission. Uh, the spacecraft, of course, is now going to start seeing the dust. The instruments are now really going to start oh, earning their money. Uh, the dust will start to increase uh, significantly now, and it will be starting to make the spacecraft wobble. So um, we, we hope we can maintain the signal. But at the same time, we're hoping we can see the nucleus of the comet with the camera. I'm hoping to see what the comet really looks like. Uh, so far, we've never seen, we've never s really seen a comet. We've seen the dust cloud that envelops comets, and, and even those from a great distance. We have preconceived ideas about the nature of comets. We believe that there is a comet nucleus in the center. We have some ideas about the origin of comets. We have worked for years on the composition of the gas and dusty atmosphere. We have pretty good ideas how much dust and gas to expect, but I'm sure there will be major surprises. I am truly excited because it was 36 years ago that I first published my conclusions that the uh, comet, the real comet, the nucleus, was made of ices and dust. And now we will be able to see what such a nucleus looks like. Quite apart from the camera, Giotto carries many other experiments. Most of them arranged on a necklace round the spacecraft. At the present moment, we can only speculate as to what a comet's made of. Giotto ought to tell us. We'll be studying the dust and the magnetic fields that are so important in tail production. We'll be looking at the chemistry and composition of the comet, its atoms, molecules, and ions, which are incomplete atoms. And then there are plasma studies. Plasma has been defined as the fourth state of matter, the others being solid, liquid, and gaseous. And this is made of broken up pieces of atoms. Well, those are some of the things that Giotto had set out to discover. It was on its way, even if, as James Burke commented, things looked pretty dicey. We'll be back to follow the rest of its journey after this break. It's back by popular demand. Follow Halley's Comet with this Caltex Planisphere and Halley's Comet wall chart. Available right now at a Caltex star shop near you. How can a kid climb a tree, or jump in a puddle, or kick a can? How can a kid boot a ball without a pair of bullets? How can a kid check a tyre, or climb a wall, or shitty a pipe? How can a kid run on bricks without a pair of bullets? How can a kid stomp in a pig, or kick a stone, or jump in cement? How can a kid be a kid without a pair of bullets? Barter Bullets, today's ammunition for a tough world. Chase, it is leading the pack. 
it's pushing ahead when there's no looking back. It's just how you feel when you know it's a real. It's a kick, it's a hit, it's a cop, cop is in, Coca Cola is in. Mm. The Golden Kiwi 86 Easter Gold 5 plus 5. First, half a million, plus five of a hundred thousand and more. Ten dollars, Monday next. Drake is really moving. We're out to get things done. The best job finders in the world. Drake is number one. We have the reputation. We've got a lot to prove. In pursuit of excellence, Drake is on the Massport mowers. Quality mowers in every price range. For every type of lawn. New Zealand's better value mower. Massport. Buy your new Massport from Smith City Market and get $100 for your old mower. Pay no deposit with five months interest free or up to three years to pay. Smith City Market and Massport. Better mowing, better value. Smith City Market. Conference Planners, the closest hotel to Wellington Airport, the Shaw Savile Lodge, is one of the country's top conference venues, where you can practically drive to your well-appointed, comfortable room, where a splendid pool area in the heart of the complex gives a relaxed indoor-outdoor atmosphere. There's a range of seminar and meeting rooms catering for larger gatherings or small workshops, and the a la carte or buffet dining is renowned. So phone the Shaw Savile Lodge, Kilburnie, Wellington, and have your most successful conference ever. Whether works of art or a load of old rubbish, find out more on Antiques for Love or Money, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock on 2. And welcome back to Halley Highlights. Well, the early information received between 11 and 12 this morning from Giotto was that the dust bombardment that the spacecraft was undergoing was a good deal worse than had been anticipated. You get some idea of the difficulties of that journey when you realise that Giotto was travelling at 68 kilometres a second. At that speed, you could travel between Auckland and Wellington in just exactly 10 seconds. And that was also making life difficult for its onboard camera, which, remember, was sending back to Earth not moving pictures, but a series of still snapshots taken at eight-second intervals of the Halley Comet head as it approached it. Its journey was being monitored by James Burke at the Greenwich Observatory. Well, there's now less than an hour to go and 231,700 kilometres to go to closest approach. As you can see on the left, there's time to go to the closest point and on the right, the distance. And from here on, from this distance out to the problem of dust becomes the major test of the mission. The first impact from the dust cloud in the coma around Halley were predicted to start just a few minutes ago and we've heard that that's exactly what's happened. Let me remind you of what's happening out there in space. Giotto is heading in towards Halley like this, with its protective dust shield forward, and I'll get back to that particular dust shield in a second. There you can see it spinning around with the dust shield leading. Now, the theory is that the dust I'm talking about happens as a result of the sunlight evaporating the icy surface of the nucleus of the comet and the explosion of superheated gas pockets in that surface sending a dust shooting out in great fountains to spread perhaps as far as, oh, 100,000 kilometres out round Halley. I say it's all theory because nobody knows. That's one of the things we're hoping to find out tonight. But the size of the dust particles in that maelstrom are known. They're anywhere from this size, the size of a dried pea, right down through sand grain size to tiny particles this size, so small that they almost smudge when you when you move them around, and beyond that to the size of the particles in the, smoke, in the smoke from a cigarette. Now, those dust particles are killers for two reasons. The first is communication. You see, the main spacecraft antenna, this dish here, is sending all the data and the pictures back to the receiving dish in Australia, back on Earth, oh, 130 million kilometres away. Now, the distance involved in that communications link is so great that it needs pinpoint accuracy for the antenna to make and maintain contact. One degree off, that much, and we lose contact. And an impact from one particle this size hitting the edge of the spacecraft could knock Giotto off-center enough for the signal beam to miss the Earth. 
The second danger to the spacecraft is less, shall we say, subtle. Particle impact could just destroy Giotto. That's why there is a dust shield, or rather, two of them. An outer shield here, one millimeter thick, made of aluminum alloy, like this. And an inner sheet, 25 millimeters behind it, itself 12 and a half millimeters thick, a backup shield made mostly of bulletproof plastic laminate to take the force of the particles that are big enough to smash through the outer shield and hit this inner shield like a, in, a, in the form of a jet of high temperature vaporized material. And they're expecting plenty of that kind of activity. In fact, at worst, all the spacecraft has to do is just survive through that dust storm long enough to get in really close to the nucleus to snatch its pictures and scientific data before it is possibly destroyed. And if you think I'm overdoing the drama bit, take a look at this. This is a piece of test material uh, looking at the conditions that that forward shield would encounter, the thin aluminium shield. It's been scaled up because they can't shoot, uh, they can't shoot a pellet as fast as the spacecraft is going. So the whole thing scaled up. This was made by a pea-sized object fired at five kilometers a second at this aluminum eight centimeters thick, uh, eight, eight millimeters thick. That is the same scaled up effect of one pea-sized object hitting the forward shield, that thin one millimeter thick uh, uh, shield. Now, they're expecting many, many of these impacts, perhaps as many as 10,000 a second. The second test they ran was on the Kevlar, as it's called, the Kevlar backup shield. And here they used a laser to produce the kind of effect that the jet of high temperature plasma coming from uh, the result of a particle having smashed through the front shield, the effect it would have on the Kevlar. And as a matter of interest, over here on the edge, there are tiny, there's a tiny detector, there are several of them around, as you'll see soon, that actually detect the, those impacts happening. And that was what I was talking about when you were looking at the screen on which we will be able to show you the effect of those impacts as they happen because of computer generation. The key point, encounter, as you can see on the countdown, will happen 51 minutes, just under 51 minutes, and 213,000 kilometers from now. There are, as you would expect, from what I've said about the dust, several experiments on board measuring those impacts. Two experiments reg registering impacts by the very small particles, and one run by the University of Kent for the bits large enough to call what they're expecting to make real trouble. Tony McDonnell leads this British experiment. It's called the Dust Impact Detector, or DID. Giotto's leading surface carries three tiny sensors. The inner shield carries one more. The sensors are miniature microphones to record the impact of particles hitting Giotto faster than a bullet. McDonnell's main problem is that he doesn't know just how big the particles will be. And will the twin shields be enough to protect Giotto? He tests the system with tiny glass beads. The mini microphones record the impacts, telling McDonnell the size and position of Halley's dusty missiles. At the moment, the experiment's going very well. We're getting a high-level activity on the front dust shield, and this is showing that some of the particles are going through to the rear, and uh, it does so show that the meteoroid protection system is working. Looking at the next few minutes, we're going to find the activity increasing, and several thousand per second later. What's important is that we get through the point of closest approach and come out of the comet on the other side. So you see there from what Tony McDonald was saying, they're already getting impacts that are going through that front shield. By the way, it's called the sacrificial shield, and now you know why, because even this far out, what, 206,000 kilometers with 50 minutes to go, they're beginning to get impacts going clear through that front shield. Well, the predictions are, in fact, mm, that they will hit a fair amount of these medium-sized particles early on, and then, hopefully, the impact rates ought to drop off a bit before those rates start to rise inexorably towards maximum density as we move towards encounter. Question is, Will Giotto survive long enough to get close enough to learn something about what that nucleus is made of? Well, dust or no dust, the camera is certainly sending back results, and there's quite a difference between this picture and the last one you saw. Now, remember, Giotto was approaching the comet at something like 68 kilometers per second, and that makes a tremendous difference, even over short periods. And now we can actually start to see structure in the comet. 
Once again, let me remind you that these colors are not real. They indicate differences in brightness and therefore differences in density. And there's no doubt that the densest and brightest part of the comet is that white blob you can see at the bottom. And that is where the nucleus is, even though we can't actually see the nucleus itself at the present moment. And then red, blue, green, and purple indicate lower and lower light levels. So at the present moment, the camera is sending back good results. And of course, as it goes in closer and closer, uh, we shall get better and better results. And uh, one thing we know, though, for certain now, the camera itself is working really well. James. Well, this is where the camera sits, with its mirror poking out from behind the dust shield. That camera's job, of course, is to detect the nucleus and then take as many color pictures of it as it can. The delicate camera is Giotto's most immediately dramatic experiment. Already it's sending back a continuous stream of pictures. This is Giotto's eye, giving scientists the chance to see a comet's nucleus. The camera can be rotated to take pictures both ahead and behind Giotto as the spacecraft skims close to Halley. The hope is that the camera will survive the dust storm, mounted as it is behind the bumper shield. Its pictures in four colors allow scientists to establish the size and shape of Halley's nucleus. From 500 kilometers away, the camera can pinpoint an object a mere 30 meters across on the comet's surface. All this while Giotto itself is spinning four times a second. Incoming light, and maybe dust, bounces off a steel mirror into a telescope. The image is then focused onto two charge coupled devices, or CCDs, which take the picture. This is what the charge couple device looks like. Hundreds of lines of light sensitive spots, and as the spacecraft rolls, I'll use my finger to imitate that, and the image moves across the camera mirror, one thin cross section of the image at a time is stored on here for a few microseconds and the data sent back to Earth. And then the next line, and so on. It's hairy stuff, but that's quite a camera. I mean, it could, for instance, get a clear shot, they say, of a mole on the face of the pilot of a Concorde going by a mile away at the speed of sound. Which is great if the Concorde isn't in the middle of a cloud, which according to last week's Russian pictures, Halley is. Now, from eight or 9,000 kilometers, the Russians weren't expected to see the nucleus. Even so, the cloud they did see looked very small and very dense. When all the Darmstadt scientists got together to discuss that particular matter, all hell let loose. Some wanted to send Giotto very much closer than the planned 500 kilometers. But the camera team naturally wanted to play it safe and steer clear to over 1,000 kilometers away from anything that would sandblast the motor of their camera. <laughs> With two or three times as many camera scientists occupying far more space than any other experiments, it would have made it a waste of money to build a spacecraft that could go to half that distance, to 500 kilometers. So in the best European tradition, they compromised. They chose a target distance the other day of 540 kilometers, almost exactly what had been originally intended. Just now, as you can see, the distance to go is 185,000 kilometers with just, uh, just under 45 minutes and closing. What are the pictures like from this distance? Patrick. Well, they're pretty good, and the camera is working very well. But one thing we have got to remember, as Giotto goes into closer approach, it makes a very, very rapid pass of the nucleus, only about 10 seconds or so. And altogether, Giotto spends only about four minutes closer into the nucleus than Vega did. So it's got to be a very fast business altogether. But all the same, they seem fairly confident that they will get better pictures than Vega obtained. The procedure, by the way, is for Giotto to send back a raw picture and then, after a few minutes, uh, it's enhanced. So you get a better, bigger and better view of it. And that's the way it is done. And all the pictures you're getting, going to get tonight will be on this false color principle. And I say again, the colors are not genuine. But already, the comet is showing structure. And uh, as we get closer and closer to the nucleus, there's no doubt at all that these pictures will gradually improve. So is the nucleus really a dirty snowball? That was the theory put forward by Dr. Fred Whipple over 30 years ago. You're still confident about it. I certainly am. I to prove that it is true. Uh, particularly radar uh, observations, radio reflections from the nuclei of four comets showing that there is a discrete body in each one of them. What evidence are you looking for from Giotto? Well, particularly the, the shape and the surface characteristics of the nucleus because 
Uh, so far, this has been entirely a matter of imagination. Now we will see the real thing. So you're, you're really hoping to see the nucleus tonight? I'm really expecting to see it tonight. Up. It's got to be good for you. A car's performance depends on more than just brute strength. It requires aerodynamic design and superior styling, with precision engineering and total engine efficiency. New Honda Accord, design excellence that has become legend. Now, with the improved power and economy of Honda's brilliant 1.8-litre 12-valve engine, invest in the unique driving experience that is Honda Accord. We are back with Halley Highlights, where astronomers Frank Andrews and Martina Steinhardt are taking notes on the information carried in those pictures that Giotto is sending down. 12 hours ago, as it were, as it approaches Halley's Comet. James Burke mentioned earlier in the programme that plotting Giotto's pass alongside Halley had been helped by the presence earlier this week of two Russian Vega space probes in the neighbourhood of the comet. They'd sent back some very important information. Patrick Moore takes up the story again. Both the Russian probes, the Vegas, have been very successful. They're also of tremendous value in the Giotto mission because now we have at least some idea of what to expect. Both the Vegas bypass the comet between 8,000 and 9,000 kilometers. The instruments recorded strong electric fields and electron currents. The plasma density was measured, and there were indications of a tight inner dust shell. Vega 2 took some fascinating pictures. Look at this. It seems rather like a double nucleus, although there must presumably be some sort of connection between them if it really is a double nucleus. Let's hope Giotto will tell us more. But... There's always the dust striking the spacecraft at 68 kilometers per second, and it did do some damage. Remember, though, that the Vegas weren't equipped with the dust shields, anything like so efficient as Giotto's, so they were much more vulnerable. Dr. Sagdiev, did you actually see the nucleus? Uh, I hope so. Uh, we have seen the structure of the region, which scales uh, within only a few kilometers, and the nucleus uh, is uh, certainly there. But probably uh, we have to redefine the, what nucleus really is. It's not, uh, it doesn't look like solid rock. It looks like uh, uh, something of uh, sophisticated, uh, maybe double structure. And uh, the edges of this uh, object are uh, completely made obscure because of probably a lot of dust uh, streams and that. What about the comparison of Vega 1 and Vega 2? Uh, the first impression is that uh, Vega 1 uh, and Vega 2 uh, had encountered different comets. The reason uh, why it's so, uh, uh, we have confirmation from different experiments that comet was much more active during uh, the first encounter. It was much more dusty. These uh, jets... Uh, and uh, one spacecraft entered inside extremely dense jet, and uh, number of uh, counts for the uh, dust particle impact went up uh, more than an order of magnitude. Were you disappointed that some of the instruments were damaged by the dust? In, in principle, we were ready for kamikaze mission. And uh, uh, 
my personal judgment was that uh, we were very lucky to come in such uh, a condition. We certainly have lost a uh, few experiments, and uh, we have lost uh, more than 50% uh, of solar panels. But still, it's OK. I think uh, it uh, gives a very good uh, hope for Giotto to go through at much closer distance and to be alive. But ironically, just as that hopeful expression was being made, it was at this stage that there were some serious suggestions or suggestions of serious problems with Giotto uh, because the signals were not, all of a sudden, being clearly received. And there was a possibility, indeed, that it might have been destroyed, just bombarded to bits. Patrick Moore explains what he thought might have happened. Uh, one of two things has happened. I mean, disregarding a straightforward instrument failure on board the space car, which at this juncture I think is extremely unlikely. It's some outside influence, all right. So it can really be only one of two things. Or rather, one of three things. It could be that um, uh, an impact has put the camera out of action. It could be that an impact has put the entire spacecraft out of action, or even destroyed it. Or it could be that the antenna is now misaligned. And I think everyone's going to hope devoutly that that, in fact, is what has happened. Because if so, there's every chance that we should be able to reacquire the signal in a period ranging from something like 15 minutes, and it happened several minutes ago now, which could be any moment, I suppose, uh, up to an hour. And uh, if that is so, then all may not be lost. But of course, the further away Giotto is, the less information is going to send back. And once it's passed up by being past the nucleus for an hour, then it's going to be back well outside the main region. And we really shan't get a lot more information from it. It gets a fair statement, doesn't it, Anna? Yes, that's true. Yes. I got We, uh, we need to. Uh, the most interesting information comes from the last 100,000 kilometres. We've got back here in London, we've managed to uh, put together uh, the computer generated data from the latest information before the loss of signal on the DID, that's the dust uh, impact experiment. And it does seem that there was a fair pile of it in those, those few minutes back, what, 10 minutes ago when they were talking about having had a surge, which might well be the reason why the spacecraft was knocked off course and we lost the signal. I was talking while, uh, while, I was talking while Patrick was having a discussion there on the air with one of our guests here who made, of course, made the um, rather important point that does it, whether the spacecraft signals were cut off suddenly or not or faded in any measurable way would, of course, it was Colin Ronan. Uh, let me ask you to explain what you meant by that, Colin. Well, it was just that if it's knocked off course, um, and not destroyed. If the antenna moved away from uh, off a degree, then the signal should fade away. Whereas if the whole device was smashed into by yes. a large particle, you'd get a sudden, then you'd get a sudden, get a sudden cessation of all yes. signals. Well, I either way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for whatever reason we're no longer getting signals, Some obviously some magnificent data has been collected, and there's a man with Patrick now who no doubt everybody is waiting to hear from, uh, Fred Whipple, the, 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 the father of commentary himself. And after all, who better to join us at this critical juncture than Fred Whipple, the man who worked out the dirty snowball theory of the comet. Well, Fred, you said earlier on that we were going to see the nucleus tonight. Did we? We did. I'm quite sure we did, yes. It was, in fact, that red mass that we saw on the screen. Well, it uh, will have to be analyzed in more detail without all of those pretty colors, which may mislead the public as to the nature of a comet nucleus, because it's really a very black, gray like uh, perhaps black velvet or charcoal. Well, we have emphasized all the way through this program that these colors are not genuine. You don't really see a comet like that. But from those pictures, uh, what can you tell about the composition of the nucleus? Can you think it can definitely confirm finally your dirty snowball theory? Well, I think that we have enough evidence that will come out of the spectroscopic evidence, the nature of the gases and the analysis of the dust to show it conclusively. Yes. Of course, it's not only the camera. As we know, I mean, the, the camera uh, did magnificently right up to the time of closest encounter. Yes. Now, I mean, imagine those last pictures that actually came back from Giotto were taken just about the time, and it was something, only something like five, 540 kilometers yes. away from the nucleus itself. Or perhaps a little farther than that, but perhaps a thousand kilometers, but something of that order. But of course, it's not only the pair, not only those pictures that would help to confirm your theories, all the other experiments as well. Which yes. do you think are the most important of those from your point of view? Well, I don't know. There's several of them, of course. And, uh, but I think the one that tells the composition of the gas will be in the, in the uh, final, when the final story is told, will be the most important. Well, now come back to the matter of the moment. We have lost uh, all trace of Giotto. 
Uh, what do you think has happened? Has the space car been destroyed? Is it the cameras been put out of action? Or has the antenna been jolted so that the present moment we are not receiving the signal? Well, I don't think at this point I can answer that question. I think that will be a technical question. But I'm sure that the dust in the neighborhood of the nucleus did it and shows that comets are very dangerous when you go through them at 70 kilometers per second. That's very right. At least it's proved what you wanted. Fred Webber, thank you very much. James. We've got now the first real enhanced picture available uh, from the spacecraft. Uh, there you can see it. Um, and would, would you care to comment on that, uh, uh, Alec? Yes, I think it's a, it's a, it's a remarkable picture. There, there's clearly a lot of irregularity in the nuclear region there, and also a lot of surface structure that we saw before. It's much better, much easier to see it in this picture that we're seeing now. But of course, we still have to, as has been said by many massage others, uh, uh, massage it further. And, and uh, of course, we can't really make out exactly where we are in the nucleus because the color boundaries are a little bit confusing. But, but sorry, you're saying where we are in the nucleus. Uh, you, you mean a large part of this picture could represent the nucleus itself? Yes, most definitely. In but other words, we are looking at a, a, a partial view of the entire nucleus, you think? No, no, I think they're seeing the nucleus within that picture and it's probably in the area of the green part of the frame that you're seeing. But oh. just where it comes in depends very much on where the color boundaries are placed, and that is a, ma ma a matter of massaging. We'd see it more easily if it were black and white, but then we wouldn't see the whole depth of the image, yes. and that's why we're seeing it in, in this false color now. Well, let me go back to Jack Meadows. One of the things that they said before they went was that if the camera, if they got close enough, the camera worked, they would be able to see features on the surface of the nucleus, presumably after massaging the pictures, down to as small as, what, 150 feet across? Yes. Now, uh, what, well, I think what it would you was have 150 seen in... meters, but perhaps 150 feet. Never mind. Yes, sorry. What, what, oh, I've just heard we've got some new information from Patrick. Excuse me, let me go back to Dan. Yes, there is indeed. It's Patrick? rather encouraging news, and this comes from Parks in Australia, the, the, the main receiving station. Apparently, there are being signals received now from Giotto. They're very weak, and they're fluctuating, and they can't at the present moment give a picture. But the fact that they are being received at all indicates that probably the spacecraft has not been destroyed, and there are conjecture earlier on that it was, in fact, an impact which thrust the antenna to one side and made the signal miss the Earth, uh, is probably the right one. And if that is so, all the indications are that we may reacquire Giotto again in something like 15 to 20 minutes. Well, of course, then it's going to be well away from closer to approach, but it still should be enough to send back some data on the outward journey, if that is true. We can't be absolutely certain yet, but um, I'm glad to say that it is starting to look as if, after all, Giotto has not been destroyed. So, some relief at Darmstadt with the good news that Giotto had got through after all and had done its job. We'll be back to find out how well it had performed after this break. We're not the only financial organization offering cash prizes, but we are the only one offering up to quarter of a million dollars in cash prizes every week. We are the only one with 25 chances to win up to $10,000 every week and a bonus $10,000 cash prize draw every month. With high daily interest on your savings, nothing eclipses United Blue Chip. It's a winning way to save. It's here in the tropical sun that the taste of Tropicana fruit juice comes. Tropicana, Tropicana. Now if you'd like to come here too, this is all you have to do. Just close your eyes and take a sip. You're about to take a tropical trip. The taste will bring you here to me. It tastes so real because it is you see. Tropicana. Who can resist the Tropicana. pure taste of Tropicana? Now, why did you do that? Do what? Switch the video recorder on. You jest. Use the remote. Me? Face it. You're an addict. Come on. And who in their right mind would have recorded that? Regardless of what happens to us, you must tell us. It has cultural significance. G10, National's new baby. Their most simple-to-use video ever. National, in association with Fisher & Paykel.
You look great. But maybe they won't pick me. Oh, of course they will. But use my Listerine antiseptic just to be sure. But I brushed. Listerine goes further than toothbrushing to kill germs that can cause bad breath. With Listerine antiseptic every day, you'll feel even more confident. With Listerine daily, you're confident. Having trouble cleaning your twin blade razor? Only Chic Ultra has the answer. The push clean blade on the pivoting head. Easy cleaning, a smooth shave. Plus, Chic Ultra gives you a clean blade every time. There's a new oasis in town. Oh, must be a mirage. The Sparks Road Oasis in Hoonhae. A mirage, I tell you. With a seven-day-a-week dairy that's open from 7 in the morning till 10 at night for groceries and hot food, videos and photocopying, trailer hire, LPG and everything for your car. You can even win a trip for two to Queenstown or Rotorua flying Mount Cook. Oh, must be a mirage. No, it's a Corvette. The Sparks Road Oasis by the roundabout. Come in and win. Tonight, 8.30 on 2, Maddie Hayes, the media star model who goes moonlighting at her own detective agency. Welcome back to Halley Highlights. Now it's time for New Zealand scientists, astronomers, biologists to have a look at some of that information that's been sent down by Giotto and to see just what they make of it. Nowhere, of course, was the experiment followed more intently than down near the Mount John Observatory in South Canterbury at the Halley Watch site because uh, down there at the Mount John Observatory they'd played an important part in helping to set up, establish and direct Giotto en route by sending information back to Darmstadt. And the pictures just sent down by Giotto had caught the attention attention there of Alan Gilmore, Rod Austin and Pam Kilmartin, there with Peter Llewellyn. Well that last frame was obviously extremely spectacular but uh, the colour images, um, the false colour, that, does that give you a false impression of the, um, the structure of the nucleus? Oh, very much, you're, you're plotting brightnesses, uh, expresses colours mm. uh, and you can't, can't really see the, the grey details which it would be seeing grey details and that's what we want to see. Was that the sort of detail you expected to see? Um, I'm not quite sure what I expected to see. I think right in the centre there, that white patch was probably the nucleus, uh, in, in right in the middle there. But until, as everybody else has said, until they have massaged the data, processed those pictures, mm. and produced perhaps grey photographs, uh, which bring out the, the right light level, right. then we won't really be able to make too much sense of the photographs. Right. Pamela, you mentioned that there was some structure, um, some jetting in the material that had some implication for the spin of the nucleus. Yes, we have been seeing jets coming from the nucleus in the pictures we've been taking over the last two or three weeks. And I think I could pick up something that looked a bit like what we've been seeing in the green area of that last picture. Rod, your first reaction to that last picture. Well, I would agree with Alan that we probably saw the nucleus right in the centre, but I don't really think that we're seeing any great detail. Um, as I said, it... it I didn't really expect that we were going to get right into the centre and, and, and see all this fracturing. What encourages me is that the spacecraft has survived. What I thought would happen is, as the spacecraft went offline, it would then be wide open to major impacts in areas which were not protected, and it has apparently survived. So that is good news. Right. Well, obviously it's not the end of the line for Halley's Comet, and unlike those in the Northern Hemisphere, we'll still be able to see it for the next six weeks or so and uh, there's plenty of late nights yet. Thank you, Peter Llewellyn, and our thanks to the people down in South Canterbury for overcoming the most difficult odds and joining us on this Halley coverage today. Before we take up Peter Llewellyn's uh, suggestion, it may well be tomorrow night or even later after such an exhausting day as this that we go outside to have a look at the comment. Uh, Frank Andrews, time, I think, for you to be tell us a little bit of what you make of some of those pictures, but I think one of the first pictures you'd like to look at is not a Giotto one, in fact, but a Vega one, because it's about double nucleus and you've mentioned that before haven't you? Yes that's right I think this picture shows the uh, nucleus of the comet is broken into two uh, with a smaller piece probably very much smaller coming away from the primary nucleus this means and here we can see it that we've got a small piece that should be disintegrating much more rapidly because there is a much greater uh, volume to ra uh, surface area ratio. Here we've got a much later Giotto picture which perhaps shows a, a trace of that nucleus. What do you think? Yeah, I think the nucleus is still there at about 11 o'clock but it has faded away so rapidly as you can see from the material stream flowing away in the solar wind and probably this is... Uh, 
this nucleus is made of uh, very light material like water ice or so that, ev that it evaporates so quickly. Do, do you mean, Martin, the whole nucleus? And, and it's there, actually, a chunk of it is breaking away, is yeah. that what you... Yeah, this, this little chunk I'm talking about is uh, probably made of water ice mainly so that it evaporates so quickly. That's what I think indicates this photo here. It's just a small piece that is rapidly yeah. disintegrating yeah. because it's got a yeah. large surface area yeah. for a very small volume, so it's rapidly disintegrating. Yeah. Maybe that's why it broke off anyway. Yeah. Yes. But, but uh, I mean, is, is that happening, do you suggest or imagine, all the time to the comet as it moves in, nearer and around the sun? In yeah. which case it must be getting smaller quite quickly if chunks like that are breaking up. Yeah, if you, if you, for instance, think that uh, particles are being glued by water ice and this water ice melts and evaporates, then certainly bits and pieces break off. Yeah. And Frank, does that have any consequences for things that I know you and I have talked about over the past four weeks, about how long a life the comet has got? Yes, it's a little difficult to say at this stage because we don't know how frequently these pieces break off. Here we've just seen the one, and maybe many more have broken off and we've missed them. Maybe this is something that's relatively rare, and we've been very lucky just to catch it with uh, Giotto and Vega. Yeah. Yeah, so one, we need enough more pictures. And speaking of more pictures, we're really very excited because thanks to the extremely good offices and the quick work of the Ministry of Works and Development Laboratories in Palmerston North, we've mm. able, been able to image enhance, technical term, some of the pictures that we received off Gi Giotto this morning. Perhaps we could have a look at them, which give us closer views yet of just what there is in that nucleus, that head. And... from the various other experiments? Yes, basically the spectro uh, spectroscopical information. What about, um, I mean, I know this, this mm. is a stupid question and it's an early time to put it. Mm. When we started the coverage this morning, I said to you, will Giotto enable... effectively a graph that shows the brightness of the various regions as we uh, draw effectively a cross section through the mm -hmm. head of the comet and uh, I think you can see a, a trace of that uh, secondary nucleus and then looks as if there's quite a clean gap between the two uh, what do you think there Martina? 
Yeah, it is. I was just thinking that the brightness uh, pattern we have here uh, might tell us a wee bit about the uh, distribution of particular gases and plasmas drifting away from the nucleus. But it is at this stage, it is only a rough guess because this idea just came to my mind according to that. And, and again, we, we haven't got any actual quantities that we can put onto that diagram. Yeah. Uh, it's all very relative and there's nothing very absolute, unfortunately. Uh, this is the sort of thing that we hope to get over the next few days and it'll probably mm -hmm. take months, perhaps a year, 18 months to analyse fully. Uh, again, I think in a moment or two we're going to go over to another picture which will show us uh, or enable us to gradually strip away the coma of the uh, comet until we can just see the brightest little bit in the middle. And mm -hmm. this is probably the actual nucleus. And if you look very carefully... I think you're probably going to be able to see perhaps even a little bit of surface detail. Very hard to say. Uh, it's just a matter of having a look when it comes and mm -hmm. in those few fleeting yeah. seconds. Now, surface detail, you mean, because you've been saying all along that you thought it would be a darkish colour, the centre of the, of the nucleus. So the surface detail as, as between light and shade. Yes, I, uh, and perhaps even a few typographic details. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's a matter for each person to form their own opinion. Yeah. Uh, but I suspect we really are getting our first glimpse, and it is only a glimpse, of the mm. actual solid, in inverted commas, yeah. nucleus mm. of the comet. Yeah. Frank, is there anything that you could postulate now about the general makeup of comets on the basis of what you've seen out of Halley? Yes, I think we have now got a, at least reasonable confirmation of Fred Whipple's dirty snowball. I don't think we can say a great deal more than that yet. I think we're going to have to do a lot more work on the data that's come back. Mm. But... Yes, I think basically it's confirmed what we uh, originally thought, which is a little surprising because so often <laughs> space probes have totally <laughs> upturned everything that we've ever thought was possible. So, so you're not yeah. going back to write the textbooks and no, the, uh, rewrite No, unfortunately, the well, yeah. uh, perhaps a few modifications at this stage, but no, I don't think this is a complete uh, rewrite. Well, there we are. That's what you were talking about, Frank. Yes, here we have uh, the fade down. Now, watch yeah. very carefully and you'll see gradually yeah. we are subtracting the coma... Mm. And look at the brightest part right at the centre. Now, yes. about now, and you, I think are perhaps beginning to see some detail. Now, perhaps. There. That's perhaps the mottled surface of the actual nucleus itself. I say perhaps. Mm. Now, I think we come back again. Here mm. we come. And just as we build this up again. To me, this is probably the most exciting picture that we've seen in the whole of this uh, Vega and Giotto mission. Uh, and I think perhaps we're very lucky to see this. Probably we're the first television audience to actually see uh, a picture processed in this way. Yeah, I would say that this photo also clearly indicated that the nucleus is very irregular in shape as far yes. as the surface is concerned. Lumpy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah. Which may be explained by your pieces breaking off, as it were. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Pieces yes. getting undermined and then yeah. coming away. Yeah. 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 Frank, I remember, I think you told me that the estimated size of that nucleus was somewhere between six and eight kilometres. Is that yes. right, the yeah. diameter? Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps ten. Ten. And is that reinforced by what you've seen today? Uh, unfortunately, we don't really have a proper distance scale here. Yeah. Yeah. So we probably will be able to tell shortly, but from the pictures we've seen so far, because there's no absolute distance scale, I can't be sure. Yeah. All I think we can say is we've confirmed that it's about the size we thought. Yeah. I, I do appreciate, both of you, that we're making, asking you for snap judgments on pictures that you've just seen in front of you. Yeah. Martina, what does happen now? Does all that information find its way to you, and then do you begin to, I don't know, process it along with other scientists about the biology of comets and so on? Uh, yes, well, the uh, analysis uh, will be made about the uh, chemical composition of the comet, and from there on you can more or less uh, deduce what happens on the comet once it approaches the sun and uh, when it goes through pe uh, perihelion and then uh, moves on its way back into aphelion. So what happens to the uh, molecules and atoms uh, once they have been heated up and heavily irradiated and once they are freezing down again? And you will get all that and that will enable you to, to build up a picture. I would be quite happy if I <laughs> get them, yes. Let's hope you do. Yes. <laughs> Frank Andrews, I, I couldn't help but sense uh, in the coverage from Britain and, and Darmstadt uh, almost a sense of anticlimax from them that they were a touch disappointed. Is that right with the information that was got? Was it because Giotto dipped out just after that close pass? I think everybody would have liked the spacecraft to have gone on rather longer than it did. 
uh, I feel as if I'd just had a taste of a beautiful steak and not been allowed to eat it. So, yes, I feel a little bit frustrated, but... Uh, shall we say astrophysics or gastrophysics is yeah. ever like that, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> but certainly a lot further ahead than you were this time this morning. Oh, yeah. indeed we are. Yeah. And I think we're going to get a lot further ahead over the next few months as we really patiently now start to sift the details and assemble this information. This is, isn't something that I can just do, or Martina c can just do it as a sort of knee-jerk reaction. It's mm -hmm. something that takes a long, patient uh, period of logical fitting together, like almost like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Understood. Well, I wonder if I could ask a pair of you to jump out of your uh, normal professional caution a little uh, in another area. We've seen over 76 years, 76 years ago when Halley's Comet was last here, people photographed it from Earth and they looked at it through binoculars and so on. We have seen in 1986 uh, mm -hmm. a space probe going to its heart. What are we, what's going to be happening in another 76 years' time? Well, to sum up what we've said in the morning is maybe they are sending uh, passengers there, tourist companies uh, sending spaceships there to, to show the tourists a close encounter with the nucleus of the comet or whatever. And uh, as far as the uh, scientific <coughs> possibilities are concerned, I just said if it was possible to uh, pick the Strato probe up again in 76 years and, s and see what we have done now, they would probably laugh about our little instruments and say, oh, they were quite old-fashioned, but they seem to have worked. <laughs> well, I'm sure they <laughs> think they're old-fashioned. Frank, what yeah. do you think? They're going to be cosmic tours. I mean, you, I know you can get in an aeroplane now and fly up and have a look at, at Halley's Comet. Will you then get into a space shuttle and go and have a look at it? I think it's quite possible. Uh, I guess scientists are a little cautious about making predictions because we've been proved wrong so often. But, yes, I think it's quite possible. And I think that scientists, even if they don't actually land on the comet, are very likely uh, going to pay it a very close visit. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, well, a little bit like... Uh, or going up in an aeroplane to look at it, only getting much closer. And un yeah. undoubtedly we're going to fly a great deal many more elaborate instruments. But there's one other thought. I think by that time such tremendous advances have, will have been made, advances that we just can't even imagine at present, that maybe comets won't even be interesting anymore. We'll have found out all there is to know. Uh, it's a nice thought, though I think perhaps like the national debt, as we said earlier, uh, the problems will be almost surely still with us. So... It's very difficult to say how we're going to be tackling them. All I can say is a great deal nearer to the comet than probably we were even this time. Yes. Well, Halley has that sort of magic for us, uh, and it, mm. it must have raised a lot of international interest. Will that now fall away, do you think, and it will be left to your astronomical, astronomical experts to get on with their researches, or do you hope that the, you know, the, the attention that's been drawn into your kind of research will continue? Like? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so, because apart from any scientific investigation of comets and astronomical objects, there is still that magic about the people and uh, the average people are not able to get somewhere out in space and, and have a close encounter with the comet and I would very much hope that this um, enjoying the beauty of the stellar objects and particularly comets uh, in the sky will just go on forever as it was before. Martina Steinhardt, Frank Andrews, thank you both very much indeed for joining us on this historic occasion and a very exciting day. There's lots of work left for both of them and scientists all over the world as they study in detail the information that's been sent down by Giotto. And for the rest of us, as Peter Llewellyn said earlier on, there are six weeks in which we can have a look in our earthling way at Halley's Comet. Lots of ways to do that if you get in touch with your local observatory. Uh, they'll have details of the best places and special arrangements that may have been made for viewing Halley's Comet. Do see it if you can. As we've been saying often today, there won't be another opportunity for 76 years. And that makes this moment probably a good time to pass greetings to the Halley Watchers of the future who may find our programme...